Heated flooring systems are a phenomenal option for bathrooms. They heat up the floor tile and make the space way more comfortable. Today we're going to share with you how to install step-by-step -step the Dieter Heat heated flooring system. So let's dive into that video right now. So as a contractor installing this all the time, ever since Dieter Heat came out on the market, it has been it has transformed the amount of time it takes me to install this. It takes a lot of the uh, figuring out of how to do it. A lot of times when you're building a bathroom, uh, you know, you end up moving a vanity somewhere that you didn't want it to be, or you, you ended up just changing the layout of things. Old systems either required you to send out a schematic and have a, a, a mat built for the room, which takes time. It could take up to two to three weeks to get something like that in. There's other systems that would require floor leveling. You put, the, you put all the, the cables down and had a floor level everything. That can be problematic for many, many reasons. Um, either uh, some areas that were higher and low, nothing, it didn't fill in correctly. Uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it can be a difficult thing to make sure that some of the loose wires actually stay intact on the floor. So having this system, basically there's uh, components or it's a heated mat system. It's basically just like the Dietra, but it's just a little bit bigger for the cables to, 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 to fill in. You order the cable, to the dimensions. There's a great calculator on schluter.com that will give you directions on how to figure out the square footage of what you want to install for heating. So you obviously don't have to do all the bathroom if you want to leave an area out that uh, doesn't need heat or not going to be walking on. Why spend the money to do it? So this is a great, um, uh, the site has a great way to, to calculate what you need. And then you'll have to get a thermostat along with that. Just like Dietra, you want to use Curdy Band uh, to waterproof around the edges of the perimeter of the room. Uh, these are inside and outside corners. We'll show you how those are put together. That's the other great thing about this system is that the whole floor is waterproof. So there isn't any additional steps that are needed uh, to waterproof the system, which is perfect because a lot of showers and things that are being built now are curbless and it's critical to have the outside floor waterproof as well. So this is just a, basically a one-stop step process for that. Other things is just a, a quarter inch notch trowel, square notch trowel to apply the thin set for the Dietra. Okay, so for just, this is just like Dietra. It's just, a, it's, it is Dietra, it's just Dietra heat. So you're gonna be using all the same kind of products to adhere uh, this as well. What I like to use personally is Maypay. There's a, a it's called Carabond and it's unmodified, but when you add the latex uh, additive, it makes it modified. So to me, it just makes it a little bit easier because I can, I'm just buying one, you know, a bunch of bags of the unmodified deal, and when I need modified, I just add the latex to it. There's really no waste. You're not buying a whole separate bag if you're not gonna use that whole bag. It's Carolastic is the name of the latex additive in Carabond. So we're gonna mix that up. You wanna mix it up fairly loose. You wanna, you wanna mix it up so that it's loose, but you're still holding ridges in the, with the trial. Uh, and not just having that loose, you would make it looser than what you would be installing tile. And the only reason for that is just to make sure there's 100% coverage on the fleece of, of the Dietro. I fit this first sheet here. Okay, so just, just like regular Dietra, you want to keep an expansion joint between the wall and the Dietra, anywhere between an eighth and an inch, quarter inch. recommend in a longer room just you know laying out half the thin setting half of this down rolling the other half up and thin setting that down 
it makes it a little bit easier and you're not walking into that set to put this down. Uh, but when, it, when you get the rolled type, it's usually a good idea just to counter roll the roll so it doesn't have any pressure of coming up. Just being in the roll can kind of give it a little bit of a, a lift. So just kind of counteract that by, it, by rolling it back. And again, a quarter inch square notch trial. Ditra has its own Ditra trial. For the Ditra heat, you want to use a quarter inch by quarter inch square notch trial. So just like any other um, towel installation, you want to wipe any dust off with a damp sponge. And it's also kind of helps keeping the plywood from sucking the moisture out of the thin set right away. So you're not saturating, you're just wiping it off with, with a thing that's fine. Okay. And you want to burn that first layer into the plywood with the back side of the trial. Set and keep all the grooves in the same direction. on each sheet you do is to pull back the Dietra heat and make sure you have 100% coverage on that. Set it back. Okay, I'm going to work on the next side. So as redundant as, as burning this into the plywood seems, it's actually very important. Uh, maybe you even encountered it when you actually pulled up your existing floor that might have been tiled right over that plywood and how easily the tile came up. You can almost just scrape the thin set off pretty easily. By filling in this and burning it into the plywood, it's filling all those pores of the plywood and getting the thin set to bond to that actual subfloor. So, it actually seems ridiculous to do, but it's very important to, to make sure you're burning that in the fire.
you're getting Thinson on the D tray, it's probably not a bad idea at this point just to clean that out because if the wires are actually going to be going into these little grooves. So you want that to harden up and hinder the installation. such a long piece I'm actually gonna chuck check the coverage again so you want to make sure that everything's 100% covered underneath of here and we're actually missing a little bit here at the end so just double checking that it's gonna make sure you don't have any future problems with it So I'm just cutting out the edges to make sure I have that expansion and contraction joint around the edge of the floor. For instance, like if your wall isn't 100% straight, you can just take the utility knife and score it on along the wall just to get that expansion joint there. Okay, so just cutting this mat, you don't have to run it, you just have to make sure that these stubs or these studs are in line with one another because that's how the wire is going to be run through this. So you can turn as, you can make as many pieces as you really want out of the Dietra um, heat mat. So whatever is the easiest way to get that done. Uh, with such a long room and all these different cutouts going into the bathrooms and stuff, we're going to run in this particular situation the other way so that we do it. So, but it's just important to try to line these up because the wires are going to be running through them. We can't emphasize enough how important it is to burden a thin set into the wood subfloor. It's absolutely necessary. You also want to have directional troweling so that all the trowel, trowel ridges face the same direction because when you embed the detrial heat membrane, you're going to collapse those ridges. Remember, you also want the studs to be lined up like Steve is doing here with two adjacent pieces of detrial heat membrane. And what we're doing is we're compressing the membrane into those trowel marks and making sure that there are no wrinkles where the two pieces of membrane meet. Now in this case we have a walk-in shower and what we're doing is we're cutting the Dietra heat membrane to size so that it meets up with our in-floor shower pan for the curbless walk-in shower. Just check your coverage. Pull up a corner of that and check your coverage. And I'm going to get a little bit more thin set right where this where it meets the uh, outer bit of Dietra. Make sure that it sits down nicely. As you probably noticed, we're installing the Dietra heat around the bathtub. Uh, just as an FYI, if you are installing a bathtub or even a tub shower combo, you may want to check out our free guide right here. It's got a lot of great tips in it. We think it could help you out. I personally like to little, like overcut a little bit, so then when I embed this into the thin set, I can cut nicely against the wall, just to minimize any larger gaps than I want against the edge of the floor. We're going to be doing that curdy band around the perimeter of the floor, so if you're if you're, if you're kind of off on that edge, you can just fill with thin set and be fine. Um, but if you overcut, just like sheet vinyl, if you overcut and then do the details after you have it set in the thin set, it'll make it a little bit easier for you. Again, 
and just want to make sure these these stubs are somewhat in line with each other, so that when you're running the, the heated flooring through it, the wire through it, that it's not going to be difficult to uh, get in line with another one another. And that, while that's embedded now, I can just take my utility and I like 45 degree angle to the edge of the wall. Yep, I overcut that a little bit. But, uh, just allows you to get a nice quarter inch reveal. Against the edge of the top. And any excess things said just wipe out for now. bathroom area. I'm just going to cut out one row of this. So when I run the mat, I don't have to knock around it. So you definitely don't want to miss the heat in the throne room. So you want to make sure when you put these, uh, the Dietra heat mat that you're lining up these stubs to bring the heat into the room. Um, and that's another thing. Any area that you're not going to heat, you still have to put the Dietra mat down uh, just so that the whole Floor level is all the same uh, length. So if there's an area that you're not doing it, still buy enough Dieter heat mat to do the whole thing and then just run the wires where you want to. The, the toilet flange, I personally like to just run the Dieter mat over it and then cut around nicely around the flange. It just allows me to get more accurate with cutting around it. Okay, so with it over top of the toilet flange, you can just feel around to the edge of the flange and just cut around. So you still want to keep that reveal around here. I have a little bit of an overcut, but what I plan to do is just use some of the, the curdy fix and just seal around the edge of the toilet flange. Obviously, if you had a toilet overflow, water is still going to be able to get down along that side of that pipe and go down but if you have a toilet issue where it's leaking like that you have some bigger issues you know might as well try to try to make this as waterproof as possible around that okay then you can just use every bit of your scrap too like i just have this little bit of area here so i'll just be cutting two little stubs that so that there's no additional waste. Um, As you can see here, this is our wall with the electrical on it. And what we did is we ran a piece of conduit on the back side of the wall. And you don't want any thin set to block that conduit. This is what it looks like on the back side. We're gonna run all of our wires through that. Hi guys, this is uh, Bill White. I'm a registered electrician. They were trying to be smart about this project, so they decided to call an electrician to take a look at uh, all the electrical systems with this. We're gonna run through a few uh, basic tests that you need to do to check to make sure that your cable is good when you take it out of the box, that it's good after you install it into the floor, and that it's good after you have the tile on. So we're gonna open up the box and we're gonna take a look at all the stuff that comes with it. So there's just a few very simple electrical tests that need to be done with it. Uh, a lot of this pertains to your warranty. Go on the website, research the warranties, find out the exact specific tests and the ways that they want to have them done. But we're going to do a quick run through on just uh, doing some simple tests on it, some recommended tests by Schluter uh, before you get started. All right, we've got our uh, cable box here. And first thing we're going to see is our warranty information. This has a lot of the information about the tests that you need to do. Uh, for your warranties and the different uh, types of warranties that come with those tests. This silver card here is important. Don't lose this. It has your serial number on there. It tells the manufacturer the information about the cable that you have. If you did have a problem, had to call them. Okay, here's the uh, spool of resistive 
heating cable. Okay, you can see on the end here, there is a tag on the cable that has information on there as far as your voltage, some of the resistance values on here, serial number and product number. On the other side, we have the amount of uh, surface area coverage, which is 16.1 square feet. Resistance is 287.6 ohms. Ohms, if you're not sure what that is, is a value of a resistance. All heating cables are basically just resistive cables. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna test the resistance on this cable uh, just so that we can make sure that the resistance reading that we get on our ohm meter will be the same as the value written on the tag, 287.6 ohms. This is just a basic uh, electrical voltage meter. It reads uh, voltage, ohm. This one is just continuity. It makes a beep if you touch it. Let's see here. So all we're gonna worry about is this one right here. It's got this uh, ohm system, uh, this ohm symbol on there. It just looks like a, uh, well, it's an ohm symbol. Continuity tester, we're gonna test the ohms or also called the resistance of the cable. So what we're going to do is get on the black and on the red. And make sure whenever you're touching this that your fingers don't actually touch the metal because that will change the resistance value that you're reading on here. So we're going to try to hold this in a way that it won't touch that. It's better to have if you have gator clips for your tester. All right, so there we go. My ohm reader is reading. 289.7 ohm, 290 ohms, 289, and that's about right. And check again on our tag, check that value, 287.6. Uh, as long as it's within 10% of that number, that's accurate. So we're good on the first test. We know that the wire is good and it's not shorted out. Test number two is going to be testing the heating cables to the ground wire. So we're gonna test for resistance there. Basically what we're looking for here is we don't want to have any resistance, or sorry, we wanna have infinite resistance between the ground and either one of these heating cables. If the resistance is extremely high or basically infinite. It all depends on your tester. Like different testers are gonna have different values that they show. Um, this one basically shows a zero. So it doesn't even recognize that we're testing anything. So that's good. That means that these are not shorted. We don't wanna have the ground or any of the hots shorted together, basically meaning that they're touching anywhere. Because if they were touching anywhere, then it would just kick the breaker and the heater wouldn't work. So we're gonna, I'll show you that right now. We're gonna put these ground and that together. See, my resistance is almost nothing, meaning that there's a short. So we'll test that from black to ground. Still got nothing on the meter. Red to ground. We're still good, nothing on the meter. All right, so what we're gonna do here, this is the third test. Uh, this is our mega ohm test. This is a mega ohm meter. What it does is it will inject a thousand volts into the, into the wire, and what that is going to do is test whether or not there is anything in this uh, cable that is close to shorting. Electricity doesn't necessarily have to travel through wires. It can uh, jump from one uh, conductor to another depending on how close it is. So whenever you test something at a thousand volts, it could be up to a sixteenth of an eight inch that this electricity can jump. Now this system is gonna use 240 volts in the heating floor system. This thing is going to inject a thousand volts in it. That way it can give us basically a stress test on it to let us know if there's anything even slightly possible in the future of shorting out. It's a very simple test if you have the tester. You're just going to clip one to your uh, red lead and then one to your, to your ground lead. And what this is going to do is just, like I said, it's going to test to see if there's any possibility of a short between the red and the ground. This is highly unlikely to come out of the box in that condition, but it's recommended to run the test be while you take it out of the box, after you glue it to the floor, and then after the tile is down. You wanna run this test three different times to make sure that nothing happened while you were installing the wire. So let's go ahead and test this. Very simple on this tester, you just turn it to 1,000 volts, hit the test button. Oh, I gotta hold that in there a little longer. And as long as we got anything over 1,000 mega ohms, we are good. That means that we have 2,200 uh, mega ohms resistance when running 1,000 volts through there. It could still sense the potential difference in the other wire, but it cannot conduct and that's why we are getting 2200 uh, mega ohms resistance. So we're gonna test this also on the uh, black lead versus the ground as well. 
just to test both sides, make sure there's no possibility short between these two wires. Hold that in there again, and we got 2200 again. So that means that this cable is good, which is what you're most likely going to find uh, whenever you purchase this product. That completes our testing of the cable, the heating cable itself. Then what we're gonna wanna do is test our thermostat wires. This is a thermostat wire that comes with the wire itself. Now, when you buy this system, you're going to get a thermostat wire that comes in the box with your heating cable, and you are also going to get a thermostat wire that is going to come with your thermostat. You're going to ask yourself, why do I have two thermostats? Very simple solution. Plan B. Always have a plan B. So we're going to install plan A. This is the one we're actually going to hook to the thermostat. Inside this box is the other thermostat. That's our plan B. We're not going to hook that up. We're going to leave that in there just in case we need plan B. But first off, we're going to go ahead and test these. This is a thermostat that works on a resistive connectivity. You put that on ohms. Ohms is uh, that little symbol right there. Looks like a uh, upside down U. Clip one lead to your red and one to your blue. Now this type of thermostat, as I was saying, it works on a resistance versus temperature. So based on the temperature, we'll give you a uh, certain value of resistance. And if you look inside your warranty information, those resistances are listed in here. So right here it shows your uh, degrees in temperature and the resistance in ohms that you're gonna get out of this out of this sensor. So right now in this room, it's about 68 degrees. And hold our test button here. 11.3 ohms resistance. If it's like 60 degrees, might be, might even be warmer, might be 70 in here. That's, that's coming out about exactly right. So here's another way of testing it to be extremely accurate, is to uh, just hold it in your hand. Your body's 98.6 degrees. We look on the scale, 86 is at 8.3. The longer I hold on to this, the lower that number is gonna go. So if that number keeps going lower, we know it's working. So now we're gonna test the uh, thermostat that comes, or sorry, the sensor for the thermostat. So we're gonna open up this thermostat, and here it is. And we're gonna test this the same way, just to make sure that it is functional, coming out of the box. We're also gonna do this test again later. All right, we are getting, as predicted, 12 ohms to 12 kilo ohms resistance. I'm gonna put this in my hand and close it up, and we're gonna make sure this number drops. That means the sensor is functional. We should get all the way down below eight kilo ohms resistance. And that, is 100% accurate. We're good. We got two good sensors here. Make sure that when you're done getting all the numbers, you write it down on the warranty information, the warranty sheet that is, that comes with your Dieter heat. This is really important for the purpose of the warranty, and it's, it's nice to have it at your fingertips just in case you, you need it. Chances are you won't if you follow all the directions in our tutorial, though. Okay, so now that we've tested our wires and we have put the mat in place, there's a couple rules of thumb with running the wires that you want to try to plan out before you go ahead and start running the wire. And one of them is wherever your cabinetry is, you don't want to be running that wire underneath the, the, uh, the cabinet. Uh, you want to be three inches away from every wall. Uh, you want to be six inches, six to eight inches away from any like a toilet flange or any type of drain, and then you want to be eight inches away from any heating source, especially if you had an in-floor heated source, like if you had a, um, a vent in the floor, you want to be eight inches away from that. So our cabinet is going to obviously go here where our drain is, so we're going to just measure out 21 inches. That's going to be our uh, depth of our cabinet, and we're going to do a 42-inch cabinet. So I'm just going to put this tape on top of the heat trip. And it's just going to give us a reference mark just to make sure that we don't run those wires underneath of, uh, underneath of that area. Now this is something that if you plan ahead on what you're going to be using, you could run wire underneath there. If you were using a, uh, like a floating sink or a freestanding sink where there's no toe kick underneath the sink, you can run wire underneath there. It's only for the cabinets that are going to have um, you know, basically the whole structure to the floor. Uh, basically the idea is you don't want to be trapping heat underneath of that vanity. So uh, if you know what you're going to be doing, um, then that kind of helps out. You can run heat through there. But really, you might as well order the smaller amount of roll, the amount, amount of uh, heat tape, 
I mean, why heat underneath the vanity if, if that's not, you're never, you're never going to touch that. Okay, so that marks out. We want to avoid putting any wires in that area. But in this particular situation, we have two separate heating cables that uh, they give the amount of square footage that we need. So we're going to just start out with the bigger roll and work our way over this direction and then use the smaller roll going into the whole toilet area room. And that's one thing you want to keep reference to is when when you're trying to figure out the square footage of your of your room, definitely account for areas that the cable is not going to go through. So we have about a um, 100 square feet within this room. We have a tub deck. We have uh, this cabinet. Uh, we want to subtract that square footage from the entire value of where we want to heat. And you always there when you get on the Schluter website, they're going to have a little calculator that gives you description of uh, what length of wire you would need in square footage, always round down. So if you had 91.2 square feet you want to do um, and they sell an 88 square foot, don't get the 96 square foot rule, get the smaller size rule. It's always easier to have less wire and, and uh, maybe eliminate some areas that you're never really going to walk in than to have too much wire because you cannot cut this wire. What we're going to do is, so this is considered a cold splice, and this has to be in the floor, it has to be underneath the end set. So you want to make sure that this isn't going up in inside the wall or anything. You want to make sure that it's going to be inside the wall. Now what you want to do is just cut out some of the Dietra mat. And then embed that into the, uh, into the mat or into the onto the subfloor <clears throat> because obviously if you stick this on top of there this is this is a little bit more than a quarter inch it's going to give you a problem with with sand setting tile over top of it and what i like to do is actually just to chisel out a little bit of the floor because even with this down it actually is bumped up a little bit more than what the Dietra mat is with large format tile that's not going to be too much of an issue because usually are using a 3 8 inch notch trial and that uh, won't really hinder this but if you were to do some kind of mosaic floor tile of some sort where everything has to be perfectly flat this might be worth the extra step just to just to do it. and really all you're needing is like a 16th inch so it's really not that much So I'm just making sure that that's nice and level on there. These cold splices, I personally like to use a hot glue gun. It uh, just makes ensures that this is going to stay in place where I need it before running the wire. Okay, so again, the rule of thumb is to be three inches away from any edge of any wall or tub or any wall structure. So you want to be three inches away, three studs away from the wall. You want to be six or you want to be eight inches from any heating source. So if you have an in-floor vent heated source, you want to be eight inches away from that. And then from any drain location, like a toilet flange, you want to be six inches away from that. Other than that, you can run this wire pretty much any other way you want and just be three inches apart. So three studs apart. In this particular situation, since this is kind of towards the edge of the room, I have two rules. I want to take this wire and I want to wrap it all the way to the other side of the room and work my way back. Because uh, one of the things that you, I mean, you can't space them any closer than three inches apart. So using up some of the extra wire uh, can be somewhat difficult if I just started right here and worked my way over. And if I didn't have enough on the other side of the room, then I got to pull it all back up and, and try to reef and angle it so I have enough coverage over there. So we're just going to run this wire three studs away from the wall. And since we, uh, the edge of our vanity, the toe kick actually is indented, like we, we figured 21 inches, you can go up to that vanity. So you don't have to be three inches away from where your vanity is actually going to sit, because actually most cabinets that are enclosed at the bottom, the cabinet comes out here and then three inches in is where the toe kick is. So I'm just going to run this wire straight up to the, uh, the vanity. So 
you can hear how that just snaps in. So this wire is nice and flush with the top of the, the Dietra mat and it's held in very well with it. Now you could use a grout float to make things a little bit easier. So you can see all three inches apart here. Now, most bathrooms are not gonna have an issue with it, but if you had a very large room that was more than 10 foot long, you don't wanna run these wires continuously straight for more than 10 feet. And if you did, you just have to do a simple jog like this, and that just keeps that wire intact. You know, if you're going over 10 feet in length, just do a little jog like this and then continue. But in this situation, we don't have really any length that's going to be longer than 10 feet. So the beauty of this is that you could just make this wire fit any dimension um, that you want. It's, uh, it makes it a lot easier and less planning when you can just be able to wrap these wires. With an unsquare room with different cavities and whatnot, right here I have six studs away from this tub. Now obviously I can't bring the wire down here and come back and stay within my spacing rule. So what I'm going to do is continue my zigzag down along the room and keep six studs away from the tub all the way around so that I bring my excess wire length along that tub to stay within my three inch spacing rule. Uh, it'll make sense in here in a second but as you can see I don't want to leave all that area unheated so I'm just going to continue my wire and, and bring the excess back so again I'm, I'm keeping six studs away from the top so that I can bring my my remaining wire right down through the center here and continue it And that's, that's another beauty, beautiful thing about this system is that if for some reason it didn't work out, I didn't plan correctly or I didn't run the wire correctly, you just pull this back up and put it back in. When you have other systems that you're hot gluing to the floor and things didn't work out the way they're supposed to, good luck getting that back up without damaging the wire. So this really kind of makes it foolproof. It's very quick. You know, if I ended up screwing this up where I couldn't get rid of my excess wire, I can pull it back up and figure out a different way to get as much of the wire down and stay within those minimums. As you can see here, Steve ran that wire back toward the walk-in shower, just like he said he was going to do. And again, that's what makes Dietra Heat so great. Now, the second wire, the second spool of wire, we set it up just like the first spool and then ran it into the room where the, the toilet's going to be. Now, keep in mind, you want to keep this wire away from the closet flange so that it doesn't melt the wax ring. Yeah, then the end will just snap in just like anything else. Okay, so for your floor sensors, there's going to be two floor sensors. One that we already explained that was in the package with the wire and one with your thermostat. You want to run both sensors in the floor separate locations. One is just basically for an insurance. If anything ever went happen with one of the floor sensors, you can hook up the other one. So you want to make sure that they're, I mean, I would just put them on opposite sides of the room or uh, pretty far from each other. There's no sense in, in putting it in the same area. So the, these floor sensors are not going to just snap in. You want to have it in between the two wires. You don't want to have it uh, closer to one wire, not the other. So the best way is to just basically just cut the Dietra, the Dietra stud and then just slide the, the sensor at a diagonal that we have the same spacing between uh, each wire. And then since this wire is so thin, it doesn't it doesn't exactly stay in, it doesn't snap in place like the Dietra wire does. So you just want to jog this around like every three studs. And that kind of just helps 
uh, keeping it in place so it doesn't pop up during any pin setting or while you're walking on it. And then we're going to put the other floor sensor on the other side of the room. Just to have that for security. So this little jog is just to keep this wire sitting in place. Three quick tips about the Dieter heat sensor. Uh, number one, if you have a skylight in your bathroom or in the space where you're going to be putting the Dieter heat, make sure that that sensor is in place where uh, a lot of light comes down through the roof because that will heat up the sensor and give it a false reading and the Dieter heat won't kick on. Number two, if you have an animal, for example, a dog or a cat, and they have a favorite place in the room where you're putting the Dieter heat, let's say that the dog likes to kind of sit next to the bathtub, don't put the sensor there as well because the sensor will pick up the heat from the dog and it won't allow the Dieter heat to kick on. Uh, this was a really great tip that we got from our Schluter representative, Roger. This happened to another homeowner and they found out that the dog was sitting on top of the sensor and preventing the Dieter heat from working properly. And then tip number three is don't put the sensor directly in front of a vent. So let's say you have a vent that's forcing air into the bathroom. Don't put the sensor there because that hot air, so let's say you have a forced air heat system, that hot air is going to blow onto the sensor and again, it's not, that's going to provide a false reading to the thermostat in the bathroom. So three quick, quick tips about the Dieter heat sensor. All we're doing here is fishing the wires through that conduit and into the box. Uh, it is a lot of wire, but it's not that bad to pull it through into that electrical box. All right, so first off, we're gonna do the test. We're gonna do the ohm test on this. So we still got our tags on here on our wires. We could see this one right here says 104 ohms of resistance across both hot leads. So we're gonna go ahead and test that and make sure we didn't make any mistakes. Now, if we're within 10%, we're in good shape. Now that is 104 point, we'll call it 104.5, with it bouncing around like that. Our paper says 104.2, that is well within 10%, so we are good there. We made no mistakes installing. Now we're gonna test the other one. Okay, and we are coming up with 288. We'll just call that 288 even. Let's see what our tag said here. Tag is at 287.6, so that is well within 10%. The next thing we're going to test is our thermostats to make sure both of those came in all right without any damage. So first thermostat. Now this was the one that had the scale of resistance based on the temperature. We started out at t around 12 degrees, maybe 13, or I'm sorry, 12 to 13 ohms of resistance on uh, 75 degrees. So we're good there. We're at 12.5 again, and it's still 75 degrees in here. Mm, might be like 72. Do splitting hairs. Right. And we got 12 ohms of resistance on that one, so we are consistent as far as the temperature versus resistance rating. So all of our circuits are good, about a half inch. And we're going to leave these wires straight because this. Here's our thermostat. I'm going to pop this guy open. Now look at the back side here. It has this little, little plate on there. So we're just going to pop that off. Just pry one side, thing comes off. Got some writing on the inside here. This says L1 and L2. That stands for, well, it says line right in the middle there. It makes it pretty foolproof. That's line one and line two. So this is your line in coming from your electric panel, and this is your load. It says right there, load. So you're gonna put your heating cables on these two terminals and your line cables on these two terminals. Now they may have in the, uh, oh, it looks like they're going with uh, L1 is gonna be your black wire and L2 is gonna be your white wire. The way you could determine this, it says L1 has an L after it and L2 has an N after it. That N is standing for neutral and the L stands for line. 
So the neutral is always your white wire. Now in this case, it's a 240 volt system. Technically, there is no neutral involved, but this thermostat does 120 volt and 240 volt systems. So I just loosened this Phillips screw at the top of this unit here. We're gonna, that, that screw releases the back just pops right out and just be careful of this guy down here you don't want to break that off that just comes out nice and easily like that Gotta make sure that thing very fragile stuff right there so just be careful with it this piece right here is the faceplate we're not going to need this right now we're going to set that aside so here on the inside we have our thermostat uh, connection points there is uh, room in here for two sensors although we're only going to use one um, we have two wires for two sensors here, but like I said, um, and as we talked in the previous videos, one of these is a auxiliary heat or auxiliary sensor, uh, meaning we're not going to hook that up. We're just going to stuff it in a box in case one fails. If one fails, then uh, we have the backup one. It's our plan B. So first I'm going to hook up the line, the main power supply in. I always do that first, um, just to force a habit out of being an electrician. Um, you always want to hook up whatever potentially could be live electric first so that that way it's at least under control being contained by something and not just flapping around because the last thing you want it to do if you for whatever reason someone goes down and hits a breaker turns it on and have one of these live leads hit something and arc out I want that so I always end up securing these first it's just a force of habit you don't have to do it okay, tighten that in and Give it a little twist. Make sure your wires don't twist around. That means they're nice and tight. The next thing that I would like to do is just hook up the thermostat leads just to get those out of the way. So we got two reds, two blacks, because I have two different um, two different heating cables for the two different heating cable systems. We're just going to go ahead and twist those together. Turn it. That basically is just going to turn it all into one system. And we're going to hook this to our load terminals on the thermostat. Now that is quite a bit of exposed copper, so I'm gonna cut that back. We don't wanna have any of that exposed copper sticking out in the box. I'm gonna have a ground wire bump into it and short it out. I always wanna keep your connections nice and clean. All right, and we're gonna hook this up to our load terminals. Doesn't matter which one goes to which. They see electric. Most people don't know this, but technically there is no difference between neutral and hot. Those are kind of small terminals, so I'm going to put these in individually. Sometimes you have to do this with this clamp style connection. We're going to get one on one side and one on the other. And we'll clamp it down. I usually, in this case, would put red with white, black with black, for obvious reasons. cut off these factory ends they give us. Not entirely sure why they have those. I guess if you were to mount that to a ground screw in the box, maybe that's what that would be for. We'll get our grounds hooked up and then we're gonna move to the thermostat wire. So at this point what we're gonna do is we are going to try to tuck all this into the box. We did not hook our thermostat wires up yet. They, they will be hooked up in just a moment. Right here you can see it has a oval shaped slot at the top of your box. That's where both of your thermostat wires are going to go through. In fact, we're only going to do one because like I said, the secondary thermostat wire is uh, plan B. So we're going to leave that stuffed in the box. We don't need that for now. I usually, with this kind of stuff, I'll twist it together, tuck it away just to make sure it's not going to touch any of these guys when it's in the box. We don't want to get any line voltage where it's not supposed to be. So we're going to take this uh, wire here, we're going to slip it through this oval top here. It's in just like that. And now, I'm going to see if we can fit all this into the box. What I used here was a 4x4 four four box, so I can get an additional volume. It has 22.0 cubic inches in there, so that gives me enough capacity to fit approximately 10, 12 gauge wires, which we only have two in here, plus these wire connections, and this unit here is going to take up two cubic inches of space. So we are well within our volume allowance on here, and the more volume the better, because in order to stuff all this stuff in here, you want to have good volume. 
And be very careful that your ground wires are not going to touch any of your terminal wires. And here I am forgetting this part. Make sure you get this right side up. There's one very good indicator on how to get it right side up. The words. Stuff it in there. I'm gonna take a good look at that and make sure that ground wire is not gonna be sitting somewhere it's not supposed to. Last thing you want to do is short this stuff out. As you short it out, you're probably gonna have to buy a new one. Okay, that's a nice tight fit. Inside your box, the thermostat comes with a little bag, a couple screws in there. These are uh, 632s, but a 632 is a size screw that's used for a device box. Line N is uh, C and D. It says N sensor, N sensor. I mean, so we're just gonna run these in here because this is our sensor. The other two is an out, is used for an expansion unit. And there comes with a sticker just to show you what it is gonna look like when it's on. I'm gonna leave my sticker on for now. Right up here is a little thing that says uh, test monthly. So um, I would probably test that monthly. And there's a little button on here that is for that. The button comes off. So I think you gotta kinda put that inside of this thing first. That is on there, and there is a Phillips head screw in the bottom of it that locks it into place. So you're gonna wanna tighten that up. Detro heat is just like regular Detro. You wanna fill in all of the studs with unmodified thin set if you have excess modified thin set you can actually fill in all of the studs with that but you have to let it dry overnight we hope that you like today's tutorial on the Dietra heat heated flooring system we wanted to walk you through it step by step because the, the mat part is really simple to install and so is the wire the electrical is what can stump people so we're really happy that bill joined us for this video and showed you how an electrician would install all the cables and test them. If you have any questions, please let us know down in the comments. As usual, subscribe to our YouTube channel and that way you won't miss out on our videos. And we hope you have a great day. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.